I was glad when they said unto me, I was glad when they said unto me, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I praise God when they said unto me, I praise God when they said unto me, I praise God when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so we're here. Jesus is almost by our lonesomes. Uh, the pandemic has uh, guided us to be cautious about gatherings and we are respecting that. We are respecting the fact that we are in the tribulation and based on all things true spoken by you, uh, the pandemic is a part of that process. But I think the other thing that is a part of the process is the confusion that surrounds the pandemic. And so we've instructed everybody to wear a mask, wear a double mask, wear the best mask you possibly can. Get a vaccination shot if you possibly can. And we have greatly reduced our worship forms and gatherings so that the spreading of the virus is not, will not find a place inside of this house. Let it not be spread inside of this beautiful building. But we pray for those that are at home watching by way of live streaming, wherever they may be. They might be right down the street. Let them have a great worship. And uh, I ask Almighty God that you'll bless Rachel and her worship today and give me the strength that I might be able to stand and speak those things that you've given unto me. And in your name, Jesus, I pray and give thanks. Amen and hallelujah. I, um, <clears throat> um, this is the 40, 48th Sabbath. We've got one more to go and that'll be it. That'll be all she wrote. Um, and I want to give a subtitle to this rather than just the 48th Sabbath to give a subtitle of the, uh, to defeat and to kill a mockingbird. Now, um, mockingbirds are rare and they're, many of them are northern, some of them are southern in terms of their genealogy, but many of the northern mockingbirds, are, and known as northern mockingbirds for instance, for, for, um, can mimic sounds of, uh, of other creatures, including unnatural sounds, such as the honking of a horn or the, uh, the sound of a, of a whistler, and also the sounds of many of the birds, uh, the robin, the hummingbird, the eagle, the owl. They are just naturally gifted to be able to produce those sounds. And some, I suppose people who study these birds, have dem demonstrated that they're able to uh, mimic as many as 200 different sounds, and this coming from a little old bird. You would think that uh, a bird, and of course having a bird brain, not very much of a size of a head, not very much a capacity for brain, but they can recall and remember and repeat and mimic accurately all these sounds that um, that are made by other instruments or other birds or animals. And uh, having said that, we would want to think about how much more our brain cell capacity is larger than that of the mockingbird and how we can, should be able to remember and to recall so many more things than they, and I'll come back to that. But the, the, I, I use the term to, def, to defeat and kill because I think the one was Leah T. Harper who wrote the book to Kill a Mockingbird back in the 1960s, a Pulitzer Prize award winning, probably one of the best read books in high school and grade school, elementary schools in America today. And a quite prolific writer about the tensions, the racial tensions that went on uh, in the, uh, that goes on in America, but specifically going back a century ago. And 
and, and so having said those two things, I have used that title because I want to demonstrate uh, that I've come today in this message, as in all messages, quite frankly, is to wage war against all the false sounds that are made by the mockingbirds of religious and false flags by religious people, politicians, the crude in spirit, the haters, and those that do not have the true and original sound of God, the voice of God that Job talks about, Job and his friends. But they've got, they're mimicking the sounds of Satan, they're mimicking the sounds of political sounds, they're mimicking the sounds. I've even heard preachers try to sound like Dr. Martin Luther King with that southern drawl of his. And so I've come today to do battle against these religious and political mockingbirds who do not carry nor understand the prophecy of Noah. And I pray the Lord gives me the strength to be able to do so. Um, Atla, as you may or may not know, as some people have raised a question who are just becoming online with us, and in terms of my understanding and what I wish to express to, to do battle, to wage war against these political mockingbirds, these giving, giving off these false sounds and giving off these false flags and leading the people down into the ditch. Um, in the prophecy of Atla, I, um, and the battle that I wish to rage, the power of this pulpit that God give me the strength, is about uh, unequivocally an attack upon the throne of Satan. And, and I would want people to know who are looking always for a goody goody prosperity message, something to make them feel good, lies about by this time tomorrow how blessed and prosperous they're going to be, would give me the, under, the liberty and would lend themselves to understanding that Allah is about the direct attack on the throne of Satan. It's not a hit and miss, and it's not an offensive move, a defensive move rather. It's an offensive move. Allah, in, in its totality, and we're gonna to try to break it down and explain it today. It is not about a defensive move where we're trying to defend ourselves against Satan, but it's an offensive move where we have made a declaration in the most powerful way to attack the throne of Satan from every measure and flank we can attack him. There used to be a song in the church some years ago, Satan, we're gonna tear your kingdom down. It's a good song and it's a relevant one. And certainly it's the song and theme of Atlai in that regard, that when I preach, I don't come up here uh, to placate people or to, if you will, pave over their wrongdoings with the blood of Jesus and how easy it is to get forgiven and get into heaven. When I come here, I come to attack the throne of Satan. When I stand to preach, I stand to attack his kingdom. I, my plan is to tear it down. I also wish to express whether it is conceivable or not, it's almost as like we in Atla are from another planet. And anyone who loves Jesus and have been saved by him and washed in his blood and born again also is like unto living, uh, coming from and being in another planet if you're on planet Earth. Because it's unequivocally clear that this kingdom belongs to Satan. Now these words are spoken by Jesus. In John's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus said, this kingdom, all of it, everything, everything from Australia to Antarctica to the North Pole and everywhere in between belongs to Satan. And not just that, but Satan told Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and that wilderness experience of Jesus fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, that all of these kingdoms in Russia and in Paris and in London and New York, that all of these kingdoms belong to him. Jesus, which one do you want? You can have anyone you want. All I require of you is that you worship me. Satan wanted to bring Jesus into the kingdom. So when anybody understands that process or so we understand the kingdom of God, we understand that we as the people of God, and Atla in particular, is a direct assault upon the kingdom of this world and all of its inhabitants and this mockingbird politicians and the religious order people. So please be mindful of that. But not just that, when I stand to preach, I stand to attack 
the fallen angels that have followed Satan out of heaven into this kingdom to help them establish this kingdom as he stole it from Adam and Eve. My job, of course, is to attack him, not to let him, not to sit back and respond to his attacks, but to attack him relentlessly every time I preach, relentlessly with the power of the word of God will he'll have no respite whatsoever because of the preaching that I do. And it needs to be clear that that's what Allah is about. And also to attack his principalities. And um, so I, I wanted to be able to get started with that today as we launch our 48th, uh, if you will, Sabbath. And also at the time, same time to give praise. I'm so thankful to be a servant of Almighty God, I can hardly contain myself. I'm thankful that the Lord has allowed me to serve him, to be his warrior, to be the man for the hour, to attack Satan. He's given me that charge and that responsibility and has trusted me to be a mighty warrior for the kingdom of, for the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. I'm honored, I'm honored, I'm honored that God has done that. But I also wish to say about Atla that it embraces the power and the truth. Now, I'll, I'll explain to you more about the vision if you don't know all of the details about Atla explained. I'll try to get into some of that at some point in time throughout this message. But Atla embraces the power and the truth of the Mount Transfiguration 7. And by that I mean in Matthew's Gospel chapter 17, the Bible says that Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain apart. And there on that mount, he was transfigured and appeared unto Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, both Moses and Elijah, the Bible says. In the first three verses of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, and Almighty God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, where Jesus made the introduction to Moses and Elijah that they should work together. And then on that mount is where Moses and Elijah, the great prophets of the Old Testament and the lawgiver anointed Jesus on that mountain and Peter and James and John were able to meet that or watch that and there was seven on that mountain so I call that the Mount Transfiguration Seven uh, of that mighty and we embrace that. Allah embraces all of that. We don't try to hide or deny the Old Testament of Moses or sometime, somehow or another make him inadequate or irrelevant or Elijah for that matter these, if you will, mockingbirds who mimic the sounds of each other and never the sound, the true sound of the voice of God. And not just that, that of the Mount Transfiguration 7, but Allah understands that Jesus was anointed not just by these, but his presence was so powerful that Jesus gave everybody the opportunity. He gave Simeon, the prophet who had been living quite a number of years, the opportunity to bless Jesus according to the law. His mother and father brought him to the temple on the eighth day by the temple in Bethlehem. And Simeon came in and blessed him according to the law of the eighth day of Moses. So Jesus starts his life under the law. And all these mimics and mockingbirds out there now trying to decry that the law is ineffective. But not just Jesus, uh, Simeon, Anna also, anointed and spoke over Jesus who had been in the temple for 80 years waiting on the prophecy of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Several prostitutes, some of them I suppose well doing with precious ointment, uh, anointed Jesus, anointed his feet, others anointed his head. And uh, so we understand this is to be the, the word of God and we use these words to attack the kingdom of Satan who would want one to think that only the holier than thou, only the Southern Baptists, only the Catholics can come now unto Jesus Christ. Not true, not true. But Atla also means God's work. When I say Atla, it means that God's work is continually advancing. That is to say it is moving forward. It is moving from the den and Eden of sin and moving to the new heaven and the new earth. It's not contracting and going backwards. Allah is the newest and the greatest and most meaningful prophecy of the day and time in which we find ourselves in this modern era. But it worked, Allah is working continually. 
uh, from creation towards the uh, New Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. But many are detracting uh, the word of God because they're nothing more than mockingbirds of some other sound that isn't even their own and certainly is not the original sound of God. Well, I'm here today to do that. And in this, you're gonna get blessed. Every preacher is most probably tempted to make people feel good. And if they feel good, they'll pay for it. They'll, they'll leave an offering or they'll say kind words to you. But if you get up and tell them what thus saith the Lord, they're more likely to want to rend you than to bless you. But up law, that's what God said, is in my estimation, I'll see where God agrees with that, is a cameo assignment to minister the fourth curse of the Bible in Noah and his curse of his grandson Canaan. There was the first three curses that God gave uh, there in Genesis chapter three to the serpent, to the woman, and then to Adam, those three curses. And then Noah, who became the new Adam of the new earth after the 40 days of rain, and Noah cursed Canaan. That was the fourth curse. And our job, my job in Atlas is to understand that, explain it, embrace it, love it, and preach it till I can't preach no more. And the proof to that that fourth curse is a prophecy uh, as the prophecy of the land flowing with milk and honey that outlaws the prophecy of the land, the heartland of the people that were cursed. And where finally that curse is fulfilled and comes to an end. Namely, as the Jews, when their slavery came to an end, they were given a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, because it was God that spoke their slavery for 400 years in Egypt. It took them 40 years to get across the desert, to get into the land, and so it is. And now the ending and the curse of, of, of slavery of the Hamites, God has brought us to a promised land as well called Atla, the finishing of that prophecy. And I'm so thankful to God he's let me to be the announcer of such a wonderful and very powerful prophecy. The, uh, the, the thing I think is important here in this title that God's given to me um, is that a mockingbird um, and, and that's what we have in churches and politics. I, I've never seen anything like the mockingbirds that are now in the Republican Party. They're all a mockingbird, the same thing. And, uh, but we stand apart. Why? Because we, we're, we're speaking God's word. We're not mimicking what everybody else is mimicking, in case you've noticed. But the mockingbird has a very small brain. You've heard people call each other bird brains because their brain is so small and their capacity to understand the world is so bereft. So people refer to other people as bird brains. But for mockingbird, and they do mimic and remember all of those sounds as well and proficiently as they do, how much more so can we if you use just as much of our brain power that we don't use? That a, have, that a mockingbird has, how much we can grow and understand and potentially understand God and understand his word. I'm convinced that humanity is in a terrible state of being. Most people stop learning at about the age 14 if their first sexual experience is all over. You can't tell them nothing. Oh, they go to college, but they don't go there and learn. I can tell you that right now. They go there to sharpen their claws so they can get a better job, a bigger paycheck, but they don't go there to learn. People go to church, but they don't go to church to learn or to be better people. They go to church to see where can they jive God out of, see if they can co convince God to give them something. If God don't give it to them, they'll steal it in the name of the Lord. I'm stealing this blessing. I'm claiming it in the name of Jesus is what they're doing. If God don't give it to them, they'll take it. They don't go to church because they want to learn something. They don't go to church because they want to be better people. But wouldn't it be wonderful if somehow or another you woke up one day and discovered that you're not using all your brain cell power. You can learn a whole lot more. If a mockingbird can learn 200 different sounds and repeat them accurately, how much more so can you learn seven new things every day by listening to James David Manning as he teach? But here we find ourselves. I think that we are expecting, and I, I believe I say that, and I want to cover all bases. I don't want to miss anybody. The reason I spoke it that way but Atla requires you to expand. 
your brain cell capacity. You got to realize your eyes have got to be open that America and all other nations are in the kingdom of Satan. This ain't heaven. This ain't heaven. And this ain't God's world. Now the earth belongs to him. He made it. But Adam gave it over to the devil. And so it is. Jesus came in and disrupted the power and the presence. But this kingdom belongs to Satan. And if your eyes are open, you'll see it. And all these buildings that call themselves churches, or these mockingbirds that call themselves preachers and prophets, you'll see it. If God gives you your brain cell the capacity to understand God and understand his word. All these years, the word of God in Genesis chapter 9, verse 17 through 27, God has spoken about the curse of Canaan. And all these years, for 400 years, uh, Hamite people have not been able to understand it. Their brains can't comprehend it. They blow a fuse. They cannot. They try to reach out that God actually said we were going to be slaves to Shem and Japheth. And when they try to understand it and embrace it in their heart, their mind blows a fuse and they go crazy. Crazy is all I do. They can't, their brain can't deal with it. It's like blowing a fuse in your house and you try to overload it with more power required then the power system is able to deliver and so in order to have to understand that God said through Noah that you're going to be a servant God said through Abraham that the Jews are going to be servants in Egypt God said it God said it but it takes a mind and an understanding to be able to come to terms with that and but it's very easy for people to understand the mockingbird mimics of and the sounds of the civil rights. Oh, that sounds good. I can jig it with that. I know that sound. And they got plenty of people mimicking that sound. Radical and racial injustice. Yeah, we've been treated unfairly. And nobody treats them nobody unfairly than how many people treating themselves. Black power. Yeah, they can understand that. And the Black Lives Matter movement. They can understand that. Doesn't take very much of a brain cell use to understand that. And so they do. And um, so they profit the empty noise of the religious and they profit from all the lies that are told on God as they try to claim and steal blessings. Uh, and the thing I think is most uh, problematic about this whole issue of these mockingbird false flag and preachers and politicians and fathers and mothers and, and the like is that they don't even know when to shut their mouths. They don't know when to shut up and just listen. A lot of people think they want to hear from God. And you have to understand the prayer dynamics is this. You can pray, but God doesn't know, he's not obligated to come right there to that meeting while you're on your knees or wherever you are and answer you. But you might get up from your knees and you might be somewhere else when God decides now is the time to give the answer. But if you're on the phone talking to somebody, or on the computer shopping, if you're all going to Amazon and you're watching what's all happening on Amazon or on TikTok or whatever else it is, well, God's going to have to take a back seat till you finally decide to get off TikTok or Instagram or Amazon or whatever it is that you do. And so if you just shut up, be quiet, be still and know that I'm God, says the word of God, you might be able to get a word every now and then. The other thing, you need to stop all that other activity that you're doing and listen to the Honorable James David Manning. That's me, of course. And I believe that God will bless you. Now, I'm going to read all of that which I just spoke about. That was just all my introduction. <laughs> you're going to be here. Now, well, I'm, I'm not going to be that long today. But um, the um, Genesis chapter 9. And verse 17 is where we're going to start. So we can clearly look at these mockingbirds. It says, and, um, and God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, that's the father of the Jewish people. Ham, that's the father of the dark-skinned, kinky-haired people. And Japheth, that's the father of the Gentile or the white people or Caucasians, you might call them. 
in this footnote, and Ham is the father of Canaan. Now these are the three sons of Noah, and of them the whole earth was the whole earth, pardon me, of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husband man, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank up the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his brethren without, his two brethren without, pardon me, and Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, which was an actual event. And um, their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, cursed. Noah said, curse, Noah said. Now this is not a mockingbird sound. This is an original voice of God. And Noah said, curse be Canaan, a servant, a servant shall he be unto his brethren. And Noah said, curse be Canaan, a servant. Now you can call that a slave if you want. He'll be a slave of slaves. Shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, who is the Jew, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, that's the Gentile white man, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. In other words, the Jew shall be his landlord, and Canaan shall be his servant. And there you have it, my brothers. There you have it. That's it. You ain't going to change it. You can disagree with it, but that's it. Now, outlaw is the prophecy of the righteous, righteous men owning Harlem. Vision is captured this, that, that righteous men, now think about this for just a second, that Harlem, let's say from 110th Street all the way to 155th Street, East River to the Hudson River, that this, this entire enclave of community will be owned by righteous men. I'm not just talking about Hamites, but I'm talking about righteous men of the Japheth sort, righteous men of the Shemite sort, Jew, Gentile, and if you will, black man. All, only the righteous people come through here to take off their hats just to ride the subway. When the train passes underneath Harlem streets, people have to take off their hats and turn off their cell phones because Harlem is owned by righteous men. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, it can happen. And yours truly is working on it. And don't you think I'm not going to accomplish it? <laughs> don't you think that somehow or another it ain't going to happen? You got another thought coming if that's what you think. But not only that, but outlaw thusly will in the greatest representation, pardon me, of God's power. There, there's nothing. Now you may not understand it because if you're living in the kingdom of darkness, if you're living in Satan's kingdom, then you're all enamored with that. And that's all you can see. But outlaw, trust me. Is the greatest representation of God's power spoken in the modern era. And Jesus has chosen Harlem as the restoration, like he chose Canaan land as the restoration of Jews when they came out of slavery. He's given Harlem to the Hamites uh, as they have come out of slavery here in America. You know, I was looking at something, this is not necessarily uh, you know, the Holy Ghost, but I was looking at the spelling of the name Harlem. Now, God's changed the name to Atla. We all know that. We all know that. God is, the new name that God has given for the community of Harlem is called Atla. Sound never heard. And in that, there's healing just in the, just saying the word of God. Say, Atla! There's healing in the power of that word. But you know, if you look at the word Harlem, it's spelled H-A-R-L-E-M. Is that right? And if you, if you delete the R-L-E from Harlem, you get ham. <laughs> I thought you might want to know that. Now, that's not necessarily Holy Ghost, but I thought you might want to be interested in that wordplay. My brothers and sisters, Harlem, now called Atla by God, a land and a community that I love, and I just want to tell you that. I just want you to know it. I want you to know. 
You know, love is an exhilarating thing. Uh, when a boy falls in love, he wakes up in the morning, there's no breakfast for him, for he lives on the love of his sweet darling Jim. And late in the night as he sleeps on his bed, visions of her sweet charms, how they dance through his head. That's how it is when a boy falls in love. Love is a wonderful thing. All the exhilaration of spirits you feel when you fall in love. You love something. Well, I will tell you, I love Jesus. I do. But also, I love Harlem. Now, I want you to hear me. I'm like that boy who falls in love with a girl. He wakes up in the morning. There's no breakfast for him, for he lives on the love of his sweet darling Jim. And late in the night as he sleeps on his bed, visions of her sweet charms, how they dance through his head. That's how it is when a boy falls in love. Well, I fall in love with Harlem. I consider this the most beautiful place on planet Earth. You know, I've had the privilege of going out to California. Elizabeth and I, we drove down Rodeo Drive, all those fancy shops from Gucci to Armani and, you know, all the others. I mean, those million dollar shops. We didn't get out and buy anything, but we drove by. But I, I've, I've been to the Champs Elysees at least five times. I've had meals on the Champs Elysees. I've eaten at the restaurants there. I've walked up and down at Elizabeth and I. We lived just off the coast. We stayed in a hotel just off the, uh, uh, the main thoroughfare, the Champs Elysees. That's that great promenade that you see with the Arc de Triomphe there in Paris, France. You see that big white monument there. That's, uh, it's on the arc, at the end of the Arc at the Champs Elysees. It's where Hitler marched his panzer wagon tanks down after he captured France. You know, I've been up and down Park Avenue. Elizabeth and I have had the privilege to visit some of the people that live in the swanky part of Park Avenue downtown on 57th Street, 59th Street. Went to a man, visited a man down there who lived in a high-rise building with a private elevator. You get on the elevator, can't get off the elevator until you reach the top floor and it opens up into his house. Nobody else can get on there. We've been there, we visited there, had dinner there. I've been there. Living in the Fifth Avenue. Had the pleasure to meet a business meeting, a financial meeting at the home of the, the, trick, chick, the guy who made the chicken, Frank Perdue, the chicken guy, now deceased Frank Perdue, met with his wife and a bunch of financial Wall Street people. Had a meeting there on Fifth Avenue, just south of the, uh, north of the uh, Pierre Hotel on the cross from the Plaza Hotel. Now, I, I've been to these places, I, I have. I, when I was out there in the world, and uh, doing my thing, which was about the biggest fool than anybody could ever have been. I, uh, my address, I lived at the Beach Coma Hotel uh, on Collins Avenue. I had a room there for months. So I went in and went out there on the beach in Collins Avenue. But I can tell you this, I've been no place as beautiful as Harlem. I can tell you that right now. See, most people have never been anywhere, so they can't tell you anything. I've been there. Oh, yes. I've been there. And um, the sidewalks and the mediums on 7th Avenue and Lenox Avenue, there's none like it in all of New York City or any place on the planet as far I'm concerned. The parks, Marcus Garvey is a beautiful park. It needs to be rehabilitated. You need to get in there and clean it up and get that tower, that fire tower, that water tower. And then you got Morningside Park and you got several other parks in this community. The most beautiful parks you want to find anywhere. As beautiful as Hyde Park. Marcus Garvey could be as beautiful as that. In front of the, if you will, the Buckingham Palace is um, Marcus Garvey. And Harlem is between the two rivers, the, the Harlem River and uh, the Hudson River. I long since learned, they told me, never go to a town that isn't close to a river. Any town that sits in the desert is never going to be prosperous. Of course, I don't know what, how you figure out what's happening with Las Vegas. But Harlem sits between two rivers, two mighty rivers flowing down from Canada, the Hudson River and the East River, flowing northward, if you will. It's a beautiful, beautiful community. You know, I, uh, Harlem is, I, I love this community. I want you to know it. I love it. Harlem is uh, the only city I've ever been to. I, I, I know they have, and, and they have, in, in Paris, there are two airports. Under there's Charles de Gaulle, the, the, the Gaulle Airport, and then there's the other one. Forget the name of it. But Harlem, but they're so far apart. We're out in the in the sticks. 
But in 15 minutes, you can, on 125th Street, you can catch a bus and be at LaGuardia Airport, an international airport. Or take a bus further and be out at John Kennedy International Airport. I mean, you just don't find that in major cities around the world. And I love this community. I want you to know that. I love Harlem. Yes, I do. I don't want to live on the Shumps of say. I don't want to live on Park Avenue. I don't. I want to live in Harlem. I love this community. You know, for 10 years, like Abraham walked the length and breadth of Israel, I walked the length and breadth of Harlem from 110th Street to 155th Street. And uh, I walked, now I want you to hear this. I want you to understand something. You hear me, you look at me, don't you play me cheap. Don't you think I'm some sort of a mockingbird? Don't you, I'm nobody sycophant, I'm nobody, and don't, whatever you do, don't you push me. Don't, don't, I, I, I can't, I can't jiggy with it. Don't, don't push me. I love Harlem. I love this community. God has sent me here. And uh, I spent 10 years of my life, an entire decade, every day, even on worship days, going out and walking the streets of Harlem. When we were worshiping on Sunday, I'd get up at six o'clock in the morning and walk the streets of Harlem to time, take a shower, and then come preach. I love this community. I have walked by every address, every numerical street address, I walk by. I walk by every street corner, every stoplight, every avenue, every boulevard, some more than a hundred times. I have walked by. These, because I, like Abraham, I want to walk the length and breadth of this community. Everywhere the soles of my feet shall trod, God has given unto me. You know, I brought, I brought these boots down this morning. You know that uh, Frank Sinatra, or Nancy Sinatra, these boots are made for walking. <laughs> and that's, that's what they'll do. <laughs> One of these days, these boots going to walk all over you. These boots are more than 25, 27 years old. And that's what they are. The, um, the cover skin here is alligator. That's what it is, it's a good gator. I had them special made. And, uh, but as you can see now, they're beginning to rip apart. They're right here, they're ripping apart. But for five years, these boots, when I'd go walking, I'd walk in these boots. And um, the, uh, these boots have been all over Harlem. I remember one snowy day, it was my charted assignment to walk from East River to the Hudson River. And I, my starting point was Lenox Avenue, 123rd Street. So I got up that morning, put on these boots but it was a foot of snow, one of the biggest snowstorms in New York City we've ever seen, but that didn't stop me from walking. I, I love Harlem. Ain't no snow, rain, nor sleet gonna stop me from walking this beautiful community that I love so much. So I put on my boots, put on these boots, headed north from 123rd Street to 125th Street, turned right, walked all the way to the East River, looked over into the East River underneath the Triborough Bridge, looked into the East River, then I turned around and headed back west across 125th Street on the north side. And I, I was mushing, the snow was on, and I was, I was mushing as I was walking through the snow. I was like, you couldn't walk, you had to mush. And nobody had cleaned the sidewalk. I had to mushing through the snow. And I mushed from East River to Hudson River. And I looked in the Hudson River, over by Hudson and 125th Street. I looked, bent over the rail and looked into that river. And then I turned around and walked back from the Hudson River 125th Street back to Lenox Avenue and back home. It took me half a day to be able to do it, but I did it in these boots. I thought you'd want to see them. This, this alligator part right here, you might not be able to see it, but it's coming apart. They're all worn out now. I, I, I don't wear them as much as I used to now because I saw this, they're old, they're 25 years old and yeah, they've been through the rain, the sleet and the snow. And um, so I, um, I don't wear them anymore. But I tell you this, if you've never worn cowboy boots, uh, I, I say this and it's not a word of a lie. Uh, you can play basketball 
or baseball in cowboy boots. Now you may not think so, if you've never worn them, you don't know they are the most comfortable shoe a man can ever wear. And you don't know that because you've never worn them. So you're doubting me, but I'm telling you, they are the most comfortable shoe a man can wear. Especially they're designed right, they're made right. The only thing you'll need if you're gonna play basketball in them, they're more comfortable than Michael Jordan's, Jordan, uh, Air Jordans or whatever else y'all use. These things are far more comfortable and more flexible. You might want to put a, a rubber slip underneath the, the sole so it'll grip a little bit better, but you can play basketball in, the, in these bad boys. And uh, they're just very comfortable. I got a pair of ostrich boots as well. I didn't bring them down. I figure you don't want to see them. But the ostrich boots, they are so comfortable. They're more comfortable than the most expensive bedroom slippers. Anybody who's ever wore a pair of ostrich shoes, especially a well-made ostrich cowboy boots, they are some very comfortable shoes. So, um, but I wanted to show you those boots. As I have walked all over this community for 10 years, I walk because I love it. I walked because God has given it to us. I say this to you, my friends, I put out a piece the other day. If you can't get to heaven, if you can't somehow or another, you can't get to heaven, St. Peter won't let you in. Come on over here to Harlem and St. James will let you in because it's just, it's just about just as good <laughs> to live in Harlem. <laughs> oh Lord, have mercy. It's just about, just about as good. Ain't too much difference between Harlem and heaven. I'm telling you, I love it. I love this community. I'd rather turn into a flaming homosexual than turn my back on Harlem or Atla. That's right. You want to take me out of Harlem, you're going to take me out of the box. I'd rather live in Rikers Island prison than turn my back on Harlem or live anyplace else other than Harlem. I, this is God's country. This is where God has spoke. Even if God had not renamed Harlem, I would still want to live in. I love it because I love the people. I love the rhythm of the people. And even now when I walk down 125th Street and I see the merchants out there barking their wares on 125th Street, I hear the various music and I see the beautiful colors of the people, the very colorful people on 125th Street. It does something to me. It just, it's like, oh Lord, how wonderful it is. The spirit of the people, the market, their incense, they're still selling dashikas in this late day and age. Out on 125th Street, I love the people. That's why I want to stay here. That's why I'm not going anywhere else. You know, the devil set the gentrifiers up here. When I started talking about how beautiful Harlem is and Champs Elysees and Rodeo Drive and Collins Avenue, the devil sent the gentrifiers up here to try to quash that. They came up here with David Dinkins and Al Shopton, buying up the place with beads and mirrors and uh, hustling the, the sell out pinch nosed Negroes who are nothing more than mockingbirds of some other ideology other than the, the prophecy of Almighty God. But I love this community. Oh, no! That's what God said. That is not a mimic sound. Now, you go home and pull up your encyclopedia and read about the mockingbird. And it'll tell you that the mockingbird, the northern mockingbird, can make sounds, mimic sounds. They're not his own. They're just sounds of something else he's heard. But Allah is a sound that no man had heard, not even the mockingbirds had ever, until God spoke it. Allah! Nobody had ever heard that sound. Nobody, 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 not even men nor angels ever heard that sound. Allah! So when you hear the politicians, the mockingbird religious leaders, they're just mimicking what they've heard. But they're not, they have not heard the sound of God. And Allah is the land where God has put this church building where I now stand in case you're someplace else watching this. And um, if you come to the Allah church building, and this building where I'm at now, uh, this is a building where if you come, people like Dorcas Little John, who has been wrestling with problems for years, but she's welcome to come into this house. She doesn't have to have on fancy garb. Don't have to be wearing special perfume. She can come just as she is. And the door's open. Come on in, Dorcas! 
That's what Allah means. <laughs> when you love the people, you love poor people. Allah loves poor people. Love Dorcas Lindsay. Atla, this building, Atla Ministry, is where thousands have been housed. We've given housing to people when they couldn't house themselves. We fed millions who couldn't feed themselves. We've given gifts to people who had not gotten a Christmas gift in years. Men didn't know what to do with it, started crying that somebody else would give them a Christmas gift. Hadn't had one in years. We baptized in our baptismal pool. In the Art Law building, we baptized men and women with AIDS. Many of them dying and wanted the last rites of a baptism. And I stood in the water with them and baptized them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Blessed Holy Ghost. Art Law, this building, that's, that's what this building does. And it does it because it loves the people. We love God's people, we love God's word. The Atla High School, the Great Tomorrow's Elementary School, a place where children love to come. They wake up before they have to wake up to come to the Atla High School, to the Great Tomorrow's Elementary School in this building. The Atla Seminary, where Dr. Manning teaches every day, though the seminary itself is inactive. The teaching goes on every day at the seminary level. Anybody who wants to learn the Word of God, just turn us on. We've got many platforms on which we can hear. We can be heard. Outlaw, this building. Outlaw, this community that I love. I'd rather be a flaming homosexual than to ever think about leaving this community. It's the place where young homeless men can come. And where one young homeless man in particular named Ella Hartfield, who is now, was homeless, searching for his life. And uh, because of the influence, we were able to get him a room with Sister Naomi Vincent, who had a seven-room apartment living by herself. He lived there, he got on his feet. And uh, we had a sermon there at night about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. This elder, who was just a young boy, a teenager at the time, is now married for 35 years, I believe, somewhere thereabout. Holds two degrees, a bachelor's and a master's degree, and an honorary doctorate degree. Staying in this church and never left. That's the kind of support we have. Elder Hartfield is a, ha is a Harlem homeowner. Bought his house here in Harlem. He's the father of a daughter who's gonna defend her dissertation for her doctorate degree this coming May, and hallelujah, and boom shakalaka goes right there. Elder Hartfield, member of this congregation here in Harlem, the Outlaw Church, is a pillar and guardian for the church, the pastor and his wife. Years ago when things were rough, people were calling the church, hey, you Blankety blank, blankety blank, Uncle Tom, you coon, you. We gonna kill you. Every day, all day, every day, all day. Elder Hartfield said, Pastor, we can't have the people talking to you like that. So he went out and did something about it, put his own life and his own freedom in jeopardy to protect his pastor. And I won't forget that, Elder Hartfield. I'm not gonna forget that at all. That you put your own future and your own safety in jeopardy so that the pastor would be protected. You walk with me and stay close by me. Outlaw, that's what God said. You know, Outlaw is a place where a young woman who had just recently graduated from Oberlin University out in Ohio and uh, Charles Finney, y'all don't know about him, he's my, one of my favorites of uh, theologians, had found an Oberlin Conservatory she graduated, got married. Her husband dragged her here, made her come down the aisle and join the church. They had a young girl. And uh, though she graduated the conservatory, her daughter is now an advanced student at Juilliard, world's greatest, if you will, theatrics and music and talent 
school on the planet. I don't know where this woman would be, probably had she not been here in Atla. Uh, she'd probably be dead, and I know her daughter would not be down at Juilliard. But that's the kind of work that this house does! That's the power of God happening in this house. The great works that flows from Atla! God wants to honor Harlem, a place where ministry, you know, this same place that I now speak about is a place where a young man many years ago came to this house with dreadlocks. Yeah, had been kicked out of a school down there in Virginia for smoking weed and dealing weed, a nickel bag. <laughs> You're dealing nickel bags and 35 ounce, one ounce of weed down there, this dreadlock wearing, if you will, from down in Haiti, came here. Wearing all them dreads. Let me see about your hair. Uh, okay, all right. We, <laughs> I guess we'll let that go. Anyway, he came here, he and his wife. He said his wife had on a pair of tight checkered pants. That's what I heard him say. I didn't see, but that's what I heard him say. And uh, he came here, listened to me for a while, decided to go ahead and marry that aspiring songwriter and singer and soloist. Uh, and they got married here in the, in the church with them dreads. And um, through the prophecy of the word of God, their, their firstborn child, Anna, was born at the altar through a prophecy that they followed, and God gave them their firstborn child. Now they got four others, five of some of those beautiful children you're going to find anywhere on the planet. They're just beautiful, beautiful in and out. In the last 20 years or so, that's what Allah has done for him. He lives in the community as well, graduate degree, and now training other young children through our education system. And um, the, um, yeah, this is the place, Atlaya, the place where Precious LaFleur walked across the stage the other day and got a master's degree from Southern New Hampshire University, a house and a pastor who believes in uplifting people, educating people. And you should never quit, you should never get up, give up. You should always seek to, to grow. And I stated when she got that degree, she didn't get it because she works in the church, she's a teacher in the school. Says that they offered her a job up at Southern New Hampshire University. She said, thank you, but no thank you. I'm not leaving Atla, I'm not leaving my children. I'm not leaving the place that has given so much life to me. I'm not leaving, I'm staying here. And so it is. I have to tell you though, that uh, the dreadlock wearing man, the elder LaFleur, he and his wife with the tight checkered pants, the elder daughter now is headed towards being a senior at New York University. They know, they know, they know had they not been here, none of that would be happening. You know, Captain David Lewis came here, he was watching me on television, dragged his wife here all the little babies he had at the time. And he had a whole lot of them while they were here. And um, has raised up his firstborn son, who's become the assistant engineer of this vast and powerful ministry. He now sits as the assistant engineer. And uh, his oldest daughter is now a lawyer, has passed the bar here in New York State. And uh, his next oldest daughter has received a master's degree from New York University after he dragged them here many, many, many years ago. Allah, hold them! That's what God said. That's what God said. And this house, this house, where ministry goes out to the senior citizens. Senior citizens have a private drivers to take them to their doctor's visits. Take them shopping. Allah, Allah! Atla, door-to-door pickup and delivery service when it's time for them to come to worship in the most greeting and most powerful way. Atla, no, I'm staying, I'm not leaving. Uh, this is too, too good a work, this is too much love. I love, I'm out of power to love. I may not have any money, but I got love. I love the people, I do. And I love to see them grow and become successful. Mother Dunlop, 
who is <laughs> healthier than a, a daughter, Esther Bennett. The Lord have mercy. Mother Dunlop's head, I think she's 98 years old. And uh, I don't know how old Bennett is, and I better not say if I do. But she's healthy, and she's able to live in a building in safety. Don't have to go to some nursing home or some residence. Oh, no! Oh, no! That's what God said. No, I'm not leaving. You know, this place is raised up an elder by the name of Joseph Smith, uh, who buys thousands upon thousands of dollars of clothing for the children in this church. <laughs> Young boy come up and sit beside me. I said, where'd you get that suit? That's a bad suit. It's a bad mamma jamma. I said, where'd you get He said, Elder Smith buys clothes and been doing it for years and never says a, a word about it, never honks, honks his horn, never try to get any attention. But every child in this church, and many of them have gone on and turned on all of us once they left here. Like wolves, they turned on us. But they used to wear the clothes that Elder Smith would buy for them when perhaps their mothers and father couldn't afford to buy it. But he did. He'd done it for years and continued, Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, no! That's what God said. And so we give God the praise. Give God the praise that we just talking about black folk. We have Japheth members as well. <laughs> you go to our Facebook page, <laughs> you say, What on earth is going on here? We got more Japheth people. And we do anything else, but I'm thankful. I, I, I'm a pastor that uh, I love to walk among the people. I do. I'm not a phony. I'm not a pinch nose. I'm not a hypocrite. I, uh, oh, I know that drug addicts and people are shooting up and prostitutes and hustlers but I love walking among them because I know one day they're going to be redeemed. And I remember what God did for me. I can't stick up my nose at them. <laughs> I was in a similar situation until God rescued me. I can't look down on them. You know, quietly as it's kept, and I say this because I don't want to disturb the people of the homeless shelter, but I'm a pastor. I'm not leaving Harlem because I love the people and I love God's word. But you know, Elizabeth and I, our bedroom is on the, on the same floor as a homeless shelter. Right down, right, you know, 10, 15 steps away from our door is a homeless shelter. We go to bed every night right next to a homeless shelter. We do. You tell me how many pastors will sleep near a homeless shelter. You tell me. Name me one. Would Obama sleep near a homeless shelter? Would he and what's her face, the fist bumper? Would they sleep near a homeless? What about you? Well, wake up every morning. The sounds of Harlem. I, I, I've not ever said it like that before because, well, because the people in the homeless shelter are not really homeless. I mean, they're they, they, they groomed and they got it going on, but it's, it's a homeless shelter. And that's where we live. Oh yeah, I could live someplace else. I could have moved to Westchester, New Jersey maybe. Yeah, I could have. But what would that profit me? No, I want to be a good shepherd and sleep among the people. I don't need to go live beside white folk to know who I am. <laughs> I love Harlem. This is my community, this is my people, and this is where I want to stay. My bedroom is just a few feet away from a homeless shelter. You know, I like to think about myself as a modern day giant slayer like David. And I want to run something past you and then I'm going to turn y'all loose. Marcus Garvey, one of my favorites and my heroes. Well, when it comes to, you say, well, Pastor Man, you have this vision of hot law and hot law. Yeah, there's a lot of things you've rolled off and the, you, 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 you gave us, and there's a whole lot of things more that you haven't said here that this church has done. This church has been a light, it's been a beacon. Pastor, you've done a lot of things, but we still don't see outlaw. You might want to say that. You might want to say that. And, um, but let me, let me say this, that um, I'm, a, I'm a modern era, postmodern era giant slayer. When Marcus Garvey was here during the time of the Great Depression, last century, Marcus Garvey, and I've studied him, 
was able to glean the last vestige of Hamite people of dignity and honor. That is to say that the Hamite men of his era, the 30s, the 40s, they were men who honored their responsibility to their wives and their children. They were small business owners who honored the fact of treating their customers right, sweeping in front of their doors, no drug use. These men, they honored the fact of working with Booker T. Washington and building schools all over America. But after Marcus Garvey put together a large group of followers, all business owners, small stores, restaurants, cleaners, drug stores, you name it. If you needed something, you could find it in Harlem and you could find it from black men that owned the store. And Marcus Garvey organized them, the National Improvement Movement, Negro Improvement Movement that he put together. And then they all put their money together and bought several big ships and sailed back to Africa, Marcus Garvey. But after that, the integrity and the dignity of the black man fell in the toilet. You know, I'm old enough to know both eras. And the problem is if you're young and you don't know, if you've never seen black men that walked in integrity and honor and loved to be corrected and rebuked and acted in honorable ways and took care of their families and built businesses, worked two and three jobs, worked their fingers to the bone to provide for their children and protect them, you don't see that anymore. You don't see that. Now they're on drugs, begging and asking somebody to give them a handout. In the, in, rather than, it's a, it's a whole new, and the last of the dignity of the black man waned when Marcus Garvey. So when he put his movement together, he had that to work with. He had honor. He had men that were honorable. He had men, men that were fathers that, and business owners, not rioters and beggars. But that doesn't happen. I don't have that. I don't have that caliber of man anymore. Marcus Garvey didn't have a failing. He didn't watch the people that were close to him. And one of the persons that were very close to him sold him out. Elijah Muhammad, founder of the Nation of Islam, black movement, in order to fester and put together his movement, had a sweltering hate barrel to dig from. Because now after Marcus Garvey, hate set in. Dignity is gone, honor is gone, and the black man is full of hate. And Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad, began to preach a false doctrine to all white men, of devils, including that blonde hair and blue-eyed Jesus. And the black man without dignity, without hope, without understanding, with a mockingbird mind, ran and joined that and put on a bow tie stood on the street corners of every city in America and declared the white man to be a devil, that he was created in the lab by some fellow named Jaku. I mean, you're talking about mimicking, talking about mockingbirds, of an ideology that so many fell for. And then they raised up Malcolm X, who finally discovered that the devil, white people aren't devils. Well, anybody could have told him that. But he had that to draw upon that the Negro, the black man, was the first man on planet Earth, that the white man was created in the test tube, and they went for it. <laughs> they went for it! Well, hell, I don't see any difference than that. People going for Obama, <laughs> calling himself a black man, coming out of a white test tube. That tube that Obama came out was a white womb. It was a white tube, and yet he said he's black. I don't see the difference between what Elijah Muhammad did and what Obama did. And they both carried a Muslim cadence. <laughs> but they went for it! Yeah, they went for it, hook, line, and sinker. Dr. Martin Luther King had the liberals on his side. The guilt-ridden white people. You know, the white people did not come to the 60s, and their, their fathers had come out of the great industrial revolution, and the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, and they had money all over. They had money's grandmammy. And they know what to do with it. All these young white people. And here come this young preacher. Let's join with him and help the colored folk. <laughs> Let's march with him and try to get some relief for the colored people. So they all joined and brought their pocketbook and their media, brought their cameras. And Martin King took off like an eagle because of all these guilt-ridden white people who had no intent of understanding the prophecy or understanding Negroes in general. 
They just wanted to see how they can make themselves of use. They had nothing else to do except smoke uh, weed and drop acid. And so they joined with Dr. King. Then one day they decided to leave him, took away their media, took away their money, and then somebody killed him. But Obama, now here's another one. Here's another mockingbird. Here's another mockingbird. He had on his side. Now when you compare, what am I working with? How am I going to make this movement of outlaw go down the tracks? Obama had all the gays, everything that was gay or thinking about being gay. Ooh, Obama. Ooh, isn't he so handsome? Chris Matthews. I get a funny feeling running up my leg when Obama walks in the room. Isn't he so, no drama, Obama. Isn't he so cool? Obama. Pinching those Negroes. Self-hating Negroes, liberals, the liberal media, and Wall Street. That's what he had when he ran and put together his short-lived spirit of delusion and deception and led a whole lot of people. And all of this was run by King Satan, the devil himself. So I thought I might want to let you know I'm on the on the job. I thought I might let you know that uh, outlaw will happen. And uh, we're going to turn Harlem into a Mecca and those aces. That's right. I'm glad to live in this building. Got our beautiful courtyard out there where Elizabeth and I had our wedding pictures. In the summer we sit out there in our courtyard and sip the finest of champagnes and Watch the people go by. And then we take up our tables and the children in this building play on water slides and in, in many pools and have fun. You can hear the laughter all the way up to 145th Street. Outlaw! The Outlaw Building. No, I'm staying. I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm staying here with the children. I'm, they need me. They need me. They need me. I can't leave them. I can't desert them. And so... When God set the Jews free after 400 years, he gave them a land. And he was born in the land, Jesus was, that he set them free. And when he returns, he's coming to a land where he set the second group of slaves free. That's us. You know, I did a song some time ago that says, when you got God's word, you got more than enough. And I want to... Um, no, I don't have the gays on my side. I don't. I don't have the liberal media and the bleeding heart. White people just feel so guilty. Ooh, look how bad those black folk are. Those colored people, look. We need to try to help them. Let's, let's try to do something to help them. I, no, I don't have that. And I'm not able to tap into, and nor would I ever dream of tapping into just teaching hate or rap or more hate. Hate the white man, hate him. No, I would never go down that losing road. I'd never be a mockingbird for that. Never, never would I. Mm -mm, no, not me. I just got God's word. Take it or leave it. That's all. I, I got God's word. I tell you, you got God's word. You got more than enough. And I know it. I got law. That's what God said. I got it. I know it. And I know the difference between love and hate. Somebody said, there's a thin line between love and hate. Ooh, there's a thin line between love and hate. I got love and I know I don't hate my brother. I don't despise him. He may think I do, but I don't despise him. I love him. I've laid down my life to live in this community. I laid down my life to sleep near in a uh, homeless shelter. I laid down my life for my brother. And I'm not leaving him. I'm not leaving him. I'm not going to turn him over to be helped by the gays or the LGBTQ. I'm not going to turn him over and they turn him out. No, I'm going to stay here and be a stomp down man until my brother stands up and declares righteousness. I'm not leaving him. No, 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 I'm not going to let him. I'm not going to let him be run over by the wolves of Wall Street, by the LGBTQ and by the mockingbirds of political and religious jogging. I'm not gonna let them defend them. You're gonna have to come through me. Oh, I know he's on drugs. 
I know he's lost his dignity. I know he's lost his way. Ask Obama. <laughs> Ask Obama if James David Manning had not been in the earth, perhaps he could have done more. But that voice, a long-legged Mac Daddy, got picked up all over the world. Pinch those Negro got picked up all over the world. And if he stepped out of line for eight solid years, James David Manning was in Atla, in the Atla church building, raising his voice. And so therefore he could not move. You ask him, he'll tell you. Ask Anderson Cooper. They'll all tell you. They'll all tell you. Were it not for my voice defending and protecting the people. And then he'll say to come to this community just once in eight years that he's going to drive by this church and I ain't going to raise my voice. Made him sneak in the back door. He ain't getting out and waving at the people like the politician. Getting out that limo. No, because I'm out there with my people. Made him sneak in the back door. No, uh-uh. I'm not leaving my brother here. I'm going to stay here to help him. That's right. He needs my help. He don't realize it. He thinks I'm against him. But I understand. If I leave him, if I leave Harlem, God only knows what this community would become. I, I think that somebody said the other day, I think it was Evangelist Hunley or Evangelist Carter, one of them or both of them, said if they weren't in this church, they'd be dead by now. They'd be in their graves. <laughs> if they, they didn't have this ministry and didn't have me as a father figure and a pastor, they'd be dead by now. A whole lot of people feel that way. Where on earth would they be were it not for me standing beside them in the hour of need and not buckling, not giving up, not quitting, not running away, not doing any of those things that the sellout pinch nose Negroes do. No, the people need me. They do. They need Atla. And I'm going to be here. And ain't nobody going to turn me around either. I'm going to be here. No, I'm the Lord servant. I'm going to stand strong until Jesus returns. I believe when he does return, I believe he's going to land here on 123rd Street. Now, I don't necessarily have that as a prophecy, and I'm not trying to pass that off as a prophecy. But you know, when he was, gave the Jews Israel, when he came the first time, that's where he came to that land. And now he's given us Atla, the second group of slaves that are set free. Well, it just stands the reason. When he come back, he's going to come back here. And when he comes back here, he's going to find me fighting. That's right, he's going to find me preaching God's word. And all those people that like to fight against me. Yeah, well, you know, uh, God made me a battle, a warrior. And I'm willing to, I'm willing to do it. And I'm willing to do it because of my great love. I'm so thankful. You know, every day I stand in this pulpit, I come here. And in my mind, I know there are thousands upon thousands of fallen angels that want to destroy this house, want to destroy the church. I know it. I can't come up here and play and try to be cute. I can't come up here and try to please some people who don't want to hear the truth. My job is to protect and defend God's word and his people. And so when I get to a point like I'm at right now where I finished after all that preaching that I've done the last hour or so, I'm so relieved I was able to move the sermon one more time. This is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do to come here and preach. It's not easy. And you don't know if you're going to make it through. You don't know if you're going to, you don't know. You don't know. All you have to do, all, all you know is that you got to have God, ask God to help you. And so just one more day here in this second Sabbath of the new year, the 48th Sabbath of all 49, God's let me succeed and complete another message. And I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. You know, by the way, you know, those of y'all at home, you don't have to get all dolled up and dressed up way before you can kind of be a little casual. Uh, I, I hope y'all heard that when I said that. And the fast is not resumed. I haven't started the fast all over again. You know, we stopped it about mid-December sometime. I don't know when we stopped it, and I haven't called it back again. I will be calling it back, but I'll tell you what I did. You know, on Fridays, nights, the Sabbath begins, the fast begins, right? Used to be. Now, I, I, it ain't going on. I don't know when I call it. I'll call another one, and I'll give another book to write. But uh, so all Friday night, Saturday morning, you know, and we couldn't break the fast until after the sermon was over with on Saturday. But I have to tell you, I got up this morning about 1.30, went downstairs to the kitchen and poured myself a big glass of lemonade. I was drinking that, drinking that, put a whole lot of ice on it. I couldn't have been able to do that for years. 
but I did it this Saturday. So you might want to try to do the same thing because time's going to come where you can be back on the fast. All right, praise God. Well, thank, thank God it's time for the tithe and the offering. Uh, uh, we want to give God the praise for Brother Goldfinger. I got three envelopes from Goldfinger at one time. Goldfinger! Three envelopes at one time from Goldfinger. And Sister Estevez, thank you. Uh, Sister Billy, um, uh, Millie Biswas over yonder in London. And uh, I know they've been giving you a lot of trouble over there, Sister Biswas. And, uh, but I thank God uh, that, uh, and that everybody's still giving and we're able to do what we need to do, feed the children, fill up the tank. And I'm not, comp I'm, I, I'm, you know, everything has gone up. Electric electricity costs have gone through the roof. Fuel is way up, nearly $4 a gallon for oil to heat the building. Our tank is full now, that thing is 1,500 gallon tank, that tank is full, it's giving me full, 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 we ain't running out no time soon. Two weeks, we'll have to get it filled again. But I thank God because of the tithe that you're getting an increase in your life and you pass that increase on to us in the tithing. That way we can meet all the inflation expenses that are happening uh, as we go. When you 